you have entered my nerd world. Welcome to it. It's a Star Wars podcast, and I'm your host, John Justice, on the show this week. It is your spoiler speculation spectacular. All right. So, uh, Marvel versus Star Wars. Not going to spend a ton of time on this, but uh, can't help but talk a little bit about Avengers Endgame in the larger picture of this year in movies as we head towards the rise of Skywalker. So, Marvel versus Star Wars, briefly, and why I love the latter so much more. Uh, also this week, uh, dispelling the idea that The Last Jedi is going to be retconned. We'll dive into that. We're going to get in deep into all of the recent uh, Rise of Skywalker rumors, uh, Force Flashes, Romance between Finn and uh, and Rose. There was a piece of merchandise that uh, came to light this week. Uh, I posted it up on Twitter and it went viral. I'll tell you uh, the significance of that. We'll talk about the Knights of Ren, the fate of Kylo Ren, and so much more. It's all this week on a Star Wars podcast. Let's get right to it. We've passed on all we know. A thousand generations live in you now. But this is your fight. So apparently the translation for Star Wars Episode uh, 9, uh, The Rise of Skywalker, in Polish is uh, Star Wars Skywalker Resurrection. All right, we went down this road with The Last Jedi, for those that were paying close attention. Uh, This idea of Jedi being singular or plural... What does it mean? What doesn't it mean? It didn't really mean it ended up meaning much of much of anything. I don't put a lot of stock into the different translations when it comes to the to the title of the of the films. It's interesting, right? Um, but be that as it may, uh, I even though I do actually have some rumors that may go and and uh, and and lend itself to well, may go and lend some credibility to it being. Uh, Skywalker uh, resurrection, but be that as it may, again, I'm not putting a ton of stock into that. Welcome to the show this week. I am back up to 100% strength. I was so sick last weekend. Uh, I was feeling better when I recorded the show on Sunday, but the voice was going out. So this week, I've got the opportunity to dive uh, much deeper into uh, a lot of what has come to light over the course of the past week and uh, last weekend. So um, again, thank you so much for checking the show out. I uh, got a lot of listener feedback that we're that we'll be uh, working through uh, during the uh, the last uh, part of the show, and I just want to take a brief moment um, beyond thanking you for joining the show. If you are new to the show, one way that you can support uh, my nerd world is by purchasing my recent novel, uh, my science fiction novel, Embark. Uh, it is the first in a trilogy. The second book, Treasure and Darkness, is due in June. Um, I wrote it. 
not to be a Star Wars story. It is its own unique story, but I wrote it because of my love of Star Wars, and I wanted to know what it was like to do as close as what I could accomplish to doing what George Lucas did in writing characters and crafting a fun science fiction space opera adventure story. And that's what Embark is. I'll give you more details a little bit later on in the show, but keep that in the back of your mind. If you're looking for a way to support the show and you like uh, what you what you're hearing, uh, the show's grown a ton over the course of the past year, and thank you so much for that. But if you uh, if you want to support the show, go to Amazon.com and pick up the uh, the ebook, the paperback, or the audio book narrated by me, produced by me, uh, John Justice. Uh, it is available. Just search for Embark John J O N Justice on Amazon and get it for you uh, or a um, or a friend. All right, so let's get right into the show this week. Uh, Want to mention briefly. I uh, did go out. I've seen Marvel. Um, I've seen Avengers Endgame twice now. I uh, went and saw it Thursday night uh, with the family, and then my wife and I went and saw it again uh, yesterday. Really enjoyed the film. Uh, I'm not going to give any spoilers away, obviously, for those that haven't seen it yet. Uh, for for everything that came before it and what Disney and Marvel were, were capable of crafting with all 22, 23 of these films, um, it really is amazing. And... Avengers Endgame, in my opinion, capped off what they have done so far perfectly. Um, it holds up. It doesn't hold up as well, in my opinion, on a second viewing. And I think it really just comes down to the fact that I really do enjoy these stories, but I don't share the same type of connection that I do with my beloved Star Wars. Not that. Not that that matters. I, I don't. I don't, and don't misunderstand. I just. I have a, my own personal connection with Star Wars, and that galaxy far, far away uh, is so much deeper than it is for the Marvel Cinematic uh, Universe. I love all those films, and I watch all those films. I think the the backstories on these characters are, are great, and they're a lot of fun. And what they were aimed, uh, able to accomplish in Avengers Endgame was, was, was truly remarkable. Uh, but I was glad it was out and I'm glad that it is out now because I'm hoping that once we get a couple of weeks away from Avengers Endgame, that the marketing will really start to pick up for The Rise of Skywalker because that's what I am most ex- excited for. Speaking of which, there was a piece of merchandise that got released this week. I, tw- I uh, tweeted it out on uh, at the My Nerd World, uh, also on my personal account, John J O N Justice, and almost went viral tweeting it out from uh, at the My Nerd World. It was a, a pin set uh, that um, Loungefly created, and it was it's a, it was on sale at one of the stores. If you go to my Twitter feed, uh, at the My Nerd World, you can find it there. And there was a pin that showed the Rebel uh, logo, a little bit different, the Phoenix there, a little bit different. Um, there was a pin that showed Kylo's mask. Uh, there was a pin that showed Dio and BB-8. And then there was one that was really, really interesting. And it it was yellow slash gold, and it was this. It almost looked looked like a crest that you would see on a knight's shield, showing in silhouette uh, Kylo Ren and Rey with their lightsabers drawn, facing off one another, surrounded by this decorative background, and. They were basically standing in front of ripples, which looked like water. Um, could be a a nod to perhaps a final battle that might be taking place on wherever the Death Star Two uh, is. But it was just it was really interesting because a lot of people pointed out, and I agree, it looked very much like something you would have seen on the on the walls. In, in the in the Mortis arc for Clone Wars, or the the vision of the, the the brother and sister, and then the father, and the art that you would see on the walls in the Rebels um, episode, where they end up going into the world between worlds. I'm not saying that it's from the world between worlds. I'm just saying that that's the kind of artwork that it evoked, and it was just a very interesting piece. Now, granted, this is just a you know, a, a pen that you would collect, right? But I just found it fascinating that the art department and the marketing department put out something that was so distinct in that particular type of artwork. I don't believe that I've ever seen that done before. It almost looked historical in nature, seeing Kylo Ren and Rey face off 
in this particular stylized art form. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if when all is said and done and the rise of Skywalker is out that we end up with a story of balance and that the balance is achieved because of the light and the dark facing off against one another one last time to resolve this particular issue. And so this particular piece of art, like for the sake, you know, just for pure speculation's sake, it was commissioned by somebody to represent the final battle that that um, that ended up bringing about the the resolution to whatever the conflict was. I just, it was very, very interesting. And, and based off of, uh, how, how many times it was retweeted and commented on and seeing people's comments online. Um, I obviously wasn't the only one that picked up on the symbolism behind this, this particular, uh, piece of piece of art. Look, it, it's, it's clear in my mind that, and Daisy Ridley has said this in many interviews and we, and I mentioned in a last week's show and even played audio. And there's been another, uh, piece of, um, another interview clip that's been released that points to exactly the same thing. But clearly the central conflict in this particular film in the rise of Skywalker is going to be focusing on Ray and, and Kylo. I mean, in as much as at the end of revenge of the Sith, it was focusing on Ben Solo and Anakin Skywalker, um, how at the end of Return of the Jedi, it was focusing on Luke and and Vader and resolving that. Uh, Kylo Ren and Rey are going to be the focal point of this film while they go on this journey, um, allegedly looking for this MacGuffin. I, I do think, and I'm going to break all this down as I work through some of the potential spoilers this week. I do think that there is obviously going to be a lot of other facets involved. I think there is going to be something else dark side related. Obviously, something relating to Darth Sidious, to Emperor Palpatine that is going to come back into play. And I think that is going to be there specifically to put Kylo Ren into a situation to bring about the the, the redemption of Ben Solo. But be that as it may, while I speculated last week that I think there might be a possibility that that at some point in the film, Kylo Ren and Rey may team up again in some way, shape, or form. I do think the end of this film is going to be some type of conflict between the two of them that results and brings about Ben Solo's redemption. And again, I say all that knowing that I could absolutely be wrong, and I am totally a fine, fine with that. I trust the creators of this content to make what they believe are the best decisions. And I'm more than willing to keep a completely open mind with however they decide to end this nine film Skywalker saga. And these are the themes that keeps the, the Skywalker, the world that keeps the star Wars mythology alive. In my opinion, in the midst of all this cool stuff in this galaxy and I've made no mystery, my love of the vehicles within star Wars and just the aesthetic of a galaxy far, far away. I'm personally drawn into these stories and these relationships, certainly in the sequel trilogy. For me, for this fan that grew up a fan of Star Wars before he was a fan of anything else, seeing A New Hope in theater in the theater at age five, these these characters of, of Ben Solo and, and Rey mean just as much to me as Han, Luke, and Leia did, as Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi did that's why i've had no problem and no issue whatsoever with the way that they've played out this saga and treated the legacy characters because we had our time with them and it's disappointing and i will say this it's disappointing because mark mark hamill put out a a photoshop of of han solo lando luke and leia all images taken from the sequel trilogy uh, photoshopped into the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon, then he used, somebody made it, but somebody used the blue Star Wars logo, and instead of the Rise of Skywalker, it said what could have been. And Mark Hamill tweeted that out, and I'd like to believe that this is Mark trolling and being silly again because he knows there's going to be some type of reunion in the Rise of Skywalker, and we're going to get that, but... It's not helping the fandom, and I wish he wouldn't do stuff like that because there is way too much negativity in the fandom, and things like that fuel that negativity. 
putting out photoshops like that coming from Luke Skywalker himself, the guy that played the character, in my opinion, is a mistake because f- it's it's not fair to the people that love this. Well, fair is not the right word. Let me not let me let me, let me not word it that way. That's I'm, I'm wording this wrong. Being a person who was so important to this to, to to these movies and to the fandom, to put something out like that sends a message that I think lends a lot of credibility to individuals out there that don't like the sequel trilogy. And that's fine if you don't like the sequel trilogy. And and I, I'll keep saying this over and over and over again, regardless of of those of you that write me who say that I'm not being nice to people who don't like the Last Jedi. That's never my intention. I don't care if you don't like The Last Jedi. I do not care if you don't like the sequel trilogy. But also, I hope that you don't give me a hard time and you don't care that I do. I love The Last Jedi. I love the sequel trilogy. I don't think it's a majority of the fandom that hates The Last Jedi. Okay? And I do believe that you can be a true fan and still not like The Last Jedi. That's fine. But when Mark Hamill goes and puts something out there, you know, what could have been, you know, to me, that's a message saying that the, that the creators of this franchise screwed up in making the sequel trilogy. And I just think that's unfortunate and it's not helpful at all. It's only hurtful, in my opinion. It, it's 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 not helpful. And that's kind of a kind of a bummer. And that hopefully will be the most negative that I will get on the on the show this week. So, listen, here's the deal. Let me dive into it. I've, I've uh, I got a huge stack of um, of uh, information here in front of me. And I want to just work through it. Uh, I have an article here from Carlos Morales that I want to share, um, talking and addressing specifically uh, how people are using the Rise of Skywalker trailer, saying the that The Last Jedi is going to be retconned. He makes some very, very good points in here about how that isn't the case in his opinion, and it certainly isn't the case in mine. If that's what you believe, cool, man. That's cool. That's, that's fine. Just that's not what I believe. And we're all entitled to our to our opinions. And then we're going to work through a whole bunch of information that's come out this past week, mostly from Jason Ward over at MakingStarWars.net, who has uh, a ton of alleged details from the film in regards to Raylo, the Knights of Ren, the fate of Ben Solo and Kylo Ren, whether or not certain characters are going to be making a, an, another appearance in The Rise of Skywalker. Um what's going to be happening at the end of this film, Palpatine. So we'll dive into into all of that. Um, but let's go ahead and kick off. Uh, let's kick off here. When I found you, I saw raw, untamed power. And beyond that, So the title of this article here in front of me is a little bit deceiving, um, but we'll get into it. It says, Star Wars, is the rise of Skywalker really a retcon of The Last Jedi? All right. So not going to read the whole thing in its entirety, but I, I highlighted a bunch of points that I wanted to share with you. So Carlos Morales writes this. First things first. There is no evidence that The Rise of Skywalker was ever going to be a massive retcon of The Last Jedi or that Abrams or Ryan Johnson's installments were ever at odds. Abrams was involved as a producer all throughout The Last Jedi's production, and Kathleen Kennedy revealed at last year's Star Wars Celebration that Emperor Palpatine, having a role in Nine, was always part of the studio's plan. Even if Lucasfilm was suddenly upset with a film that was an unqualified commercial and critical success, the fact that Johnson's trilogy is still on track for release more than a year later is all the proof anyone should need that Lucasfilm has... No significant qualms with how The Last Jedi turned out. Beyond logistics, this idea that Johnson's film is being retconned um, has stemmed from a widespread interpretation of The Last Jedi that simply doesn't hold up with the text of the film. Okay, let me start. Let me let, let me stop here real quick. I'm going to say this again, and I, I may say it again later in the show, but I'm going to repeat. Look, if you don't like The Last Jedi, that is okay. It's fine. I do. I love The Last Jedi. I personally think that it's a it's a masterpiece of filmmaking as a film in and of itself and as a Star Wars film. At the moment, it's my favorite Star Wars film. If you don't feel that way, if you adamantly don't feel that way, any level of you not feeling that way, that's okay. It's totally fine. 
we can all be fans of Star Wars and like what it is that we like and dislike what we what we don't like. Okay, I just want to be clear. So if there are points and things that are made or comments that are made about The Last Jedi or detractors of The Last Jedi, and they are not you, like if you don't specifically do these things, like if you're not a person who sends me a message on YouTube or emails me and says that I'm a shill or not a true fan for liking The Last Jedi or that my commentary cannot be taken seriously because I don't like The Last Jedi, if you don't do those things but you also don't like The Last Jedi, I'm not talking about you. Because there are people that, that do that. I just want to say that up front so that for those of you that are that listen, and I hope you will continue, if you don't like The Last Jedi, I am cool with that, man. Art is subjective. I'm a massive Depeche Mode fan, and I don't care for the Rolling Stones or the Beatles. All right, let's get back into what Carlos Morales had to say. Um, most of this derives... <clears throat> um, oh, let me back up here. Um, widespread interpretation of The Last Jedi that simply doesn't hold up with the text of the film, that that being that The Last Jedi advocates getting rid of the pa- uh, advocates for getting rid of the past. Most of this derives from Kylo Ren telling Rey that it's time to let old things die, and also Luke's initial declaration that it's time for the Jedi to end. Yet neither of those statements are the film's core thesis, because they both been refuted in the final confrontation between those two characters. Luke's perspective has changed because of his interactions with Rey, and he spells all this out to Kylo. The rebellion is reborn today. The war is just beginning, and I will not be the last Jedi. He restores his faith in the wider ideals of the Jedi by defeating Kylo without violence. And everything good from the past that Kylo wants to see eradicated is exactly what Luke sacrifices himself to preserve. I do believe there's a good possibility that Kylo Ren and his thoughts of it's time to let old things uh, die, the the Sith, the Jedi, let it all die. I think that could play into the rise of Skywalker, especially if, there is a return of Palpatine or an attempt to bring Palpatine back. And he is moving to finish what he initially started earlier in the timeline. And if that ends up coming face to face with Kylo's idea of what he thinks the galaxy should be under the first order, I think there's a possibility that could play a huge part in Ben Solo's ultimate redemption. All right, moving through this uh, Carlos Morales article. In the trailer for The Last Jedi, both Rey and Kylo are in possession of objects of symbolic importance that have been fixed after being destroyed in the previous film, namely Rey's lightsaber, the legacy lightsaber, and Kylo's helmet. Some have taken these items being repaired to be emblematic of Abrams walking back on their character progression in Johnson's film. While we don't yet know how the character arcs arcs will be concluded in The Rise of Skywalker, these two objects thematically tie into the events of The Last Jedi. The lightsaber was splintered in Rey's, uh, Rey's confrontation with Kylo when it became clear their initial alliance was doomed to fail. But he never rejected the idea of being a Jedi. But she never rejected the idea of being a Jedi. Now that she's taken up the Jedi mantle in Luke's absence, she's reclaimed the lightsaber for herself. In a similar fashion, Kylo didn't smash his helmet because he rejected the dark side. Notice that in his list of things he wanted to get rid of, he specifically says Snoke, Vader, the Sith, the Jedi, the Rebels, and he stops there. He never rebukes the First Order which he assumes command of as the new supreme leader, or Vader, the grandfather he worships. If anything, Kylo's resolve is half-hearted, and turning on Snoke was... Sorry, my pages are stuck together. um, An act of malice, not redemption. He destroys the helmet in rage after being told by Snoke he'll never live up to Vader. But he doesn't fundamentally change after defeating his master. What does... What does he do when confronted by Luke, the man he claims is responsible for everything wrong in his life, immediately tries to kill him, same as his father. He already regressed back to the dark side in The Last Jedi. Fixing the smashed helmet is only further embracing his own fail. And I think there might even be, and this is kind of out there, but I think there might actually be something very specific 
and special about the helmet itself. I dug up an article going back to 2015 talking about Kylo Ren's helmet and specifically J.J. Abrams' comments on Kylo Ren's helmet. And again, looking at this from the angle of J.J. started this trilogy and he's going to end this trilogy, so it does make a little bit of sense that some ideas that he brought about for The Force Awakens that perhaps weren't expanded upon, he could expand upon them in The Rise of Skywalker. All right, getting back to the article. At the, end of the, uh, at the end of The Last Jedi, it provides the more likely and appropriate answer. Like with The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, the title is far more metaphorical than literal. And again, this is about the rise of Skywalker as a title, raising many questions on how the final movie will pan out. Will, uh, will, will, uh, will pan out. Luke spent most of The Last Jedi disillusioned with the legend surrounding himself because of his failure to stop his nephew from falling to the dark side or the First Order coming to power. But the movie also ends by reaffirming the value of his legacy by way of how he inspired others. Rey, the Resistance, a whole generation of young Force users across the galaxy, like the kids on Canto Bight playing with their toys while telling tales of Luke Skywalker, the great Jedi Master. The Last Jedi fundamentally believes that while the man himself may be imperfect, Skywalker's legacy is one worth cherishing. The heroes have hope because of him, and who is powerful enough to challenge such a resurgence of the light side, Palpatine, the one man who believes in the dark side most of all. Darkness rises, and the light to meet it. Okay, fantastic stuff from Carlos Morales on this um, on again talking about the the rise of Skywalker, and I think the most logical answer to what the title actually means, the rise of Skywalker, is most of the information I'm about to share with you is specifically about about Ray and Kylo Ren and some of the other individuals that may be coming in and out of this particular film. But we also know that this is a war movie. John Boyega has said this many times: the war to end all wars. Um, Rose even said, you know, the galaxy is at war. It's the war part of it that we all have not been exposed to in marketing, apart from a quick shot of a, an A-wing, uh, being, you know, crashing and some type of Star Destroyer in the, in the background. We know that war is playing a huge part in the background. So the easy explanation is that the First Order under Supreme Leader Kylo Ren is, trying to move through the galaxy and gain control in a way that the empire had already was already in control by the time we got to the original trilogy. I wonder if the rise of Skywalker is exactly what Carlos mentioned in his piece. And that is the galaxy at odds with the first order rising to defend itself, being inspired by what Luke Skywalker did in the events of the last Jedi. And I said this on last week's show. I am really excited for what J.J. Abrams can do based off of the groundwork that Ryan Johnson laid, especially when it comes to the weird doing that thing with my fingers in The Last Jedi. That those those forced bond those forced bond sequences with Kylo Ren and Rey in The Last Jedi are so rad. (laughs) They are. They're really rad. They're 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 emotionally impactful and powerful in their simplicity and i love that about the last jedi in the way that ryan johnson stripped away anything fancy and just simply brought the two characters together in their environments and talking about this on last week's show we've seen similar things of this right luke in the dark side cave sees a vision and he interacts with with um with the vision of Darth Vader and chops his head off and it's him behind the mask. I remember as a kid in the Empire Strikes Back just how weirded out and just how bizarre that was and how it wasn't until I got to be an adult that I truly understand what that whole moment in the film was trying to say. Um, You go to Revenge of the Sith and we have the visions that, well, actually in Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, the visions that Anakin is having in these clouded visions and sort of this this gray tunnel. I love that Ryan Johnson stripped it down to its bare essence and actually stripped the sound away to just leave these two 
individuals in this emotional place coming face to face with one another through the force. And what I love about that is the opportunity that it presents a filmmaker who is, I don't want to say better, but is more adept to creating films that are more accessible to a general audience than Ryan, than Ryan Johnson is. They're both absolutely artists in their own right, but Ryan Johnson's got more of sort of an art house aesthetic in the way that he, or style in the way that he shoots his films. And to have J.J. Abrams be able to take, being able to take what Ryan Johnson did and bring it to the audience in a way that's even more accessible has me super, super excited about that. I really think that The Last Jedi is going to have way more impact on this trilogy than even those of us that really love the film think. Coming out of The Last Jedi, you can kind of say the characters went through all of these difficulties and have grown because of that, setting up Episode Nine and The Rise of Skywalker, but the galaxy really isn't in that much of a different place, and neither are our main characters apart from Snoke being gone. But the truth is that Ryan Johnson really did lay the groundwork for some really interesting things to happen. And we've already seen that in the trailer, that opening shot. I mentioned it before in my um, trailer or my teaser breakdown, that opening shot of Ray doing the force flip over that tie um, silencer slash interceptor that Kylo Ren is flying. I mean, that, that to me was an incredibly artistic shot. That was very, I mean, it looks like it could have been lifted right out of, the Last Jedi. And this is a perfect opportunity to dive into um, all this new information that we've received. So I'm going to go ahead and put a bit of the spoiler warning on top of it. The hyperdrive is leaking. This is all leaked, potential leaked information. And if you don't want to uh, have the show, the, the, the movie ruined for you, you should probably stop the podcast here. If you do decide to stop the podcast here, I would encourage you to go to Amazon.com uh, as a way to support the podcast and uh, pick up either the audiobook, the paperback, or the ebook for my science fiction novel, Embark, the first in a trilogy. Um, in the future, uh, Flight Culture has replaced, um, well, actually, it's Space Culture, right? It's Flight, Air and Space Flight, has replaced Car Culture. In the future, um, on uh, on Earth, our hero Taft Guardia is in is in love with a girl, and he and his friends and the girl are thrust into the planet's survival in the wake of an industrial apocalypse and the rise to power of a corporate madman who seeks to take advantage of the catastrophe. It's the first in a trilogy. The second book, Embark Treasure and Darkness, will be out in June. It's a perfect opportunity to go pick up the first book and get yourself familiar with all of our characters and exactly the how everything gets set up leading into the second and uh, and third books. If you're a fan of Star Wars, I wrote it as a Star Wars fan. I really think you'll enjoy it. So if you're leaving the show because you don't want to hear spoilers, go to amazon.com, John J O N Justice and uh, pick up a copy for you and a, uh, or a friend of my science fiction novel, Embark. All right, so um, let's get into it. This is a lot of stuff that was taken from Jason Ward, MakingStarWars.net, and let's work through it. So during the Episode Nine panel at Celebration, they teased around some new powers, okay? Um, I believe the power they were dancing around is probably what was best described to me as Force Flash Fights. I'm sure it will be given a name more articulate that, uh, than that, but for now, that's what you get. Basically, the environment changes behind the leads of the story as they battle it out with their lightsabers. Um, uh, here is the part that I've dreaded attempting to convey, <clears throat> as it's written here in front of me. Essentially, when Rey and Kylo Ren first meet in The Rise of Skywalker, when they encounter one another again in the film, they've both become considerably more powerful. Perhaps when angry or determined that they can do what Snoke did for them, link to one another, but because of the context, the outcome is different. Instead of intimate moments with the backgrounds, the backgrounds appear to change between places we have already seen in Star Wars before. From what I understand, they end up back where they started, and Kylo does something after the encounter, which he says he hopes to talk about soon. Uh, protecting sources can't touch on what backgrounds pop up, 
And even if they did, there's no indication they're going to end up in the movie for sure. This could explain places like the Lars Homestead and Octo potentially being filmed for The Rise of Skywalker, but it also may not. It makes things even more confusing in some ways. I also don't know if every strike and clash is a new environment or if they fight in these places for a time before moving on to the next one. So, and, and we'll get a little bit more into this because I have further details on these force, these force flash uh, fights that, that take place. Um, I, I really do love this idea, and I didn't think that I would. But after seeing The Last Jedi, if somebody had tried to sort of describe the force connection, the force shipping between Kylo Ren and Rey, I think you would be hard-pressed to put it into words. It's better to see it as a visual. You think about what the force back scene did, and I mentioned this on last week's show when I touched upon this briefly. Um, I do like the idea that perhaps these individuals, because of the journey they're going on, the Force is taking them to key moments throughout these films, but key moments that represent what it is that they're trying to accomplish. So if these Force flashes take place and they end up in other parts of the saga, maybe it's because the Force is showing them this is what it is you're trying to resolve. Like imagine ending up on Mustafar and the battle between Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi in the middle of when Rey and Kylo Ren are fighting or um, on the on Cloud City between Luke and Vader. I mean, all these different moments in time where the balance was in jeopardy where the prophecy was being worked through. And so the battle that they're having between one another is the battle to end all battles on top of the war that ends all wars. And the force is guiding them through this journey to say, this is what it is that you two are at odds with and trying to go and solve. All right, getting back to more of the details here. Here's where things get confusing and dicey, according to Jason. One source told me about what they filmed in Jordan, mentioned that Kylo and his TIE fighter and Rey in a Wild West stand standoff, <clears throat> which is pretty much what we saw on the trailer. That person also said that Rey damages the TIE, and we see Kylo walking away from TIE in flames. This source said things get trippy when they first clash. And I wonder too, you know, this idea that Kylo Ren didn't fire on her, so maybe they were training. I'm pushing I'm pushing that aside because they did say in that interview with Good Morning America that there wasn't anything deceiving inside of the inside of the trailer in and of itself. I wonder if one of the if if the if the main reason why Kylo Ren didn't fire on Ray is that maybe he wasn't expecting Ray to be there. Maybe Kylo Ren was heading to a different location. Ray was trying to get him to stop because she needs to talk to him. And this goes to that speculation that I talked about last week of the still photo of Finn, Poe, and Ray, along with C three PO standing together in a group, and Ray has her lightsaber ignited, and it looks like you can see the red tri-saber of Kylo Ren and the reflection of C-3PO's helmet. Uh, I can't really rationalize why else you would have Rey in the middle of a meeting with her lightsaber drawn in a calm situation, but if these two individuals who are absolutely at odds are having to come together for some reason, then it may make some sense that the both of them are standing there with their lightsabers drawn because neither trusts either one. Okay, getting back to uh, some more of the uh, some more of the notes. Uh, let's see. More sources have said that Ray and Kylo fight one another during these moments. Um, I have another set of sources that told me about the flash fights, the force flash fights, but they said that Kylo and Ray team up against that outside threat. I talked about that several months back. The person is in a black robe and cloak. I assumed it was Snoke, Pelagus, or even Palpatine. Back when I was investigating Matt Smith, but no one would touch Palpatine back then, which was telling. These sources told me about the Death Star graveyard being back as well. My takeaway at this time is that Rey and Kylo do fight, and it causes them to flash around the galaxy when it happens. But my speculation at the moment is that since all these sources gave me verified information for the Rise of Skywalker, perhaps Rey and Kylo first meet, and they flash fight for the first time... Maybe later they use this power against a resurrected Palpatine. That's really interesting. Okay, so getting further in here, um, Jason War goes on to write this, and I, and I think I touched upon this last week, but again, I've got more time this week and I'm feeling better. So um, things, uh, these types of things, trippy things happened, 
in the Lee Bracket draft of The Empire Strikes Back, where Luke and Vader fought amongst the stars. Star Wars Rebels dabbled in the implications of the visuals that Lee Brackett laid down, and it feels like perhaps J.J. Abrams and Chris Terrio decided to make things trippy in their own way and take the force back style into the fight. We still have a lot to learn about what this is going to look like, and for now, I'm only reporting on what seems to be the solid, uh, commonly mentioned uh, things, according to several several sources. Star Wars, I think, is a lot weirder than... Well, let me. Put, I, I won't speak for you. I'll speak for me. I forget how weird Star Wars is sometimes. And when you go and watch the Clone Wars, and certainly the Mortis arc, or you go and watch Rebels... And the the connection with the world between worlds, the battle between Ahsoka and and Vader in the in the Rebels cartoon. I mean, look, Star Wars is trippy and weird and all the movies have done this. And I am just excited as a fan. And I'll say it again, that J.J. Abrams is going to mess with that because he did it a little bit. Right. He did it a little bit with the force back scene in The Force Awakens. You know, that was just enough sort of weirdness. And again, it makes it accessible. Okay, she's touching, you know, here's the easy explanation. She's touching the saber. The saber wants to show her some things, but we don't know what all these things mean yet. Then you get to the rise of Skywalker. And now we're beginning to see, along with the touching of the saber that brings about events past, present, and future, we also have the ability for these two individuals to connect across the force at one another to the point where they can actually have their finger touch and loving in Luke's hut, right? Gosh darn it, why did Luke have to go and show up? <laughs> what a buzzkill. All right, so let's move on. I got a lot to cover here. Um, Knights of Ren real quick. A lot of what I've heard about the Knights of Ren in The Rise of Skywalker pertained to the Jordan shoot. It seems the majority of their action takes place at that location. The good news is that the action sounds significant. Not only uh, have I heard that Lando Calrissian had sequences filmed for Jordan, for the Jordan set at Pinewood, but the Knights of Ren did there as well, Pinewood and Jordan. It sounds over-the-top rad to me. Look, even Jason Ward's using rad again. I don't know if uh, Lando encounters the Knights himself, but any movie where I'm seeing Lando and the Knights of Ren within moments of one another is going to be pretty exciting as as hell. Yeah, um, and we'll get into more of the Knights of Ren. I have some uh, I have some speculation on that. I basically, as we work through some some more of uh, of what was leaked, I'll give you my thoughts, and then I did a bullet point list of of speculation in regards to everything that I'm laying out for you right now. All right, here's a big one. This is a, a more recent one. Uh, and that is the return of Han Solo in The Rise of Skywalker. Okay, so here's what MakingStarWars.net said. Uh, the main sequence takes place between Adam Driver and Harrison Ford for, um, for Kylo Ren and Han Solo. One source called it a surprise intervention of sorts. Of sorts. A source that did not work on or see the sequence believed that it takes place when Kylo Ren asks... Um, the burned Darth Vader helmet to show him the darkness again. Luke Skywalker appears to be the twist in the encounter. The source was paraphrasing, but Han Solo tells Ben Solo, it isn't too late, and the sequence has a tone of forgiveness and understanding to it. He's not a Force ghost in the classic sense, and he's part of a vision or dream type moment induced by Luke Skywalker. We also know that there's the potential of a flashback scene with Luke, Han, and Leia and a young Ben Solo before he goes off to be with Luke at the Academy. Okay, um, I do like this idea. I like this idea of Luke being the one to manipulate and it being, you know, uh, being able to manipulate potentially a vision of Han Solo that could help Ben along his journey towards redemption. Um, and even maybe leaving it somewhat ambiguous to the audience watching over whether or not Han Solo truly was back or whether or not this was just Luke um, sharing this information and using his Force Ghost powers to bring about the vision of Han Solo for maximum impact for, for Kylo Ren. Um, and this all kind of comes back around to what I think is going to happen at the end of this film in this final confrontation. Again, this trilogy 
of Raylo being the end game, and I don't necessarily mean that exclusively as a romantic thing, but just Raylo being Ray and Kylo coming to coming to a head in some way, shape, or form in in the Rise of Skywalker. Uh, I, I, I I do believe that there's going to have to be some type of outside threat, probably something relating to Palpatine or even Pelagus for that matter. I'll talk about that a little bit a little bit later on. That is going to set up an opportunity for Ben Solo to get to to allow himself to be redeemed, to make the right choice finally to end the conflict once and for all. It makes all the sense in the world to me that Han Solo would go and play into that, especially considering what happened in The Force Awakens. And I know in the novelization, it's fairly clear that Han Solo walks out on that, you know, on that walkway, knowing that he's probably going to end up dying. And that he may have even assisted in some way, shape, or form, or at least allowing it to happen in order to, in his mind, go and, and help his son. So I like the idea of the father still being involved somehow with Ben Solo and reaching out to him through Luke and telling him not all is lost yet. I forgive you. Come back. No one's ever truly gone. All right. We got more here. Talked about this a bit last week, but we'll touch upon it. Um, It isn't clear if Rose and Finn are an item or working on making it work against the backdrop of intergalactic warfare. But Jason Ward was told that Finn has something to fight for. So it sort of rounds out the end of The Last Jedi where Finn finally stops running and gives his character purpose uh, now uh, that running off is off the table as it was in The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. Um, Kelly Marie Tran did participate in the Vanity Fair shoot in Jordan as well. Uh, Not sure if she was in Jordan or not, but J.J. Abrams did say during the panel at Celebration Chicago that we would see why Rose isn't with the group all of uh, all of the time. All right. So um, the latest here. And so what I have here is continuing information from MakingStarWars.net. And then the moderator on the Star Wars Reddit leaks page has been kind enough to compile a lot of this stuff. So a lot of what I have now that I'll share with you is stuff from MakingStarWars.net as filtered through the moderator of the the Reddit leaks page. Okay. So. Um, latest podcast rumors from makingstars.net, including Luke. There's something going on with resurrection and maybe sacrifice, but Jason Ward wasn't willing to commit anything to an article yet. Basically, unless he goes and puts it in an actual article, he doesn't have confirmation that this is actually going to happen in the, in the movie yet. Um, I've heard a couple of things, interesting things in regards to Kylo Ren's fate. Um, right now, I think Kylo kind of dies, but there's a twist to that, and I don't think it's forever. I think Ray does something, and it takes Kylo out, but I don't know if it's bad for Kylo or good, if it's part of his plan or not. That's something that we always go back and forth on. What is Kylo's plan? So what they dive into here, and I think I have some more details, is this idea that at the end of the film, There might be something in regards to resurrection. And I think that this could have a lot to do with Palpatine. Uh, If the Knights of Ren return from the beyond, either with Palpatine or they believe the way to bring Palpatine back, and that's what the Knights of Ren's core purpose is, perhaps there is this death and rebirth that may take place, something that perhaps we haven't seen before. With Kylo Ren, where the Kylo Ren of Ben Solo dies officially, but Ben... Solo is brought back, and that's how we get our Ben Demption. All right, uh, clarifications on past rumors and stuff said on the MakingStarWars.net podcast. Force flashes isn't an in-universe term. Um, The idea seems to be that their emotional tie and increased power makes it so that Snoke is no longer necessary, unclear if this affects time in addition to space. Um, Jason Ward said he thinks it might be like the Force backs, but with more control. This part is more speculative, speculating that the locations would span all nine episodes and mentions that the Force Awakens flashback was originally changed because J.J. did not want it to look like a greatest hits reel. Speculates now that at the end, J.J. might have gone back to his original idea. A few people of Jordan have mentioned the Wild West standoff. 
suggests that the Jordan tie sequence, right, that we saw in the trailer, Jason is assuming, he connects it with the crash tie that this, that the uh, that was seen in the crew trailer back in December. But again, that's Jason putting forward a plausible evidence together. Uh, Jason has a set of sources that say Ray and Kylo do their flash fighting against one another. Another set of sources suggest that they're fighting someone else in a dark robe. No one will say if it's Palpatine. Jason ruminates on whether this person in the dark robes may be Matt Smith. Further speculates that between because of these two, these two sets contradict. Perhaps they are indeed two fights. One with Ray versus Kylo and one with Ray and Kylo versus a third party. I really like the idea that perhaps even Pelagus gets involved with this. And I've never, right, the Snoke is Pelagus stuff. It's all dead and gone. Snoke's dead. But that scene during Squid Lake and Revenge of the Sith was so important and so crucial and so powerful. Talking about Darth Plagueis the Wise, I just have a hard time with J.J. Abrams trying to pull these movies together and not using that in some way, shape, or form. So I can't help but wonder that Palpatine, the, the, the laugh may have been heard in the trailer, and we know he's going to come back in some way, shape, or form, but maybe just maybe this is more of a Pelagus thing, and maybe that relates to Matt Smith. Um, Jason does not think that the guy Kylo attacks in the trailer is a Knight of Ren. They talk speculatively for a bit about whether this does tie back into the force back, which Jason agrees it does look similar. But there's apparently there's just no comparison between that and the Knights of Ren in the images that he's seen. And speaking of the Knights of Ren, and we'll get into a little bit more of this in just a moment, but somebody realized that in the uh, the one shot in the Rise of Skywalker trailer, if you lighten up the shot where the helmet's being reforged by those fuzzy hands, person with the fuzzy hands, uh, you can actually see a Knight of Ren in the background. And there's some further details that I'll share with you here in just a second um, in one of the more recent, uh, more recent leaks about... Uh, what that might actually entail. Uh, and there's some speculation that perhaps that's one of those things that could be cut later on, depending on you know just how long the movie ends up being. So we're going to bounce back to 2015 really quick. And I don't know how much relevancy there here there, there is to this, but I remember before The Force Awakens came out and we got some of our first good looks at Kylo Ren's helmet, that there was a lot that was said at the time and even from jj abrams about that helmet um so i went back and i found an article from slash film and peter serretta uh the back of kylo ren's helmet revealed but what does it tell us this is from 2015 uh jj abrams described kylo ren as vader obsessive the movie explains the origins of the mask and where it's where it's from but the design was meant to be a nod to vader's mask said abrams ren is well aware of what's come before, and that's very much a part of the story of the film. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, we never got an explanation as to where Kylo Ren's helmet came from. And I remember specifically wanting to see that based off of this comment. Especially the, we know that from a design standpoint, they picked the silver on the helmet because the costume designer wanted to, and JJ wanted some reflective nature of the helmet right wanted it to reflect the colors of the environment around it but i was always intrigued by the by the design on the side of the silver not so much the stripes that go up around the brow and i remember when jj abrams made this comment that the movie explains the origins of the mask we never got that so that brings me to this last part of our spoiler part of the show this week before we dive into listener feedback because i think we might be on to something And I'm really glad that I pulled that article from J.J. Abrams because this may be something that was there all along that they're probably there that that they could potentially finally bring to fruition in the rise of Skywalker. But that is the that is what's going on with this helmet. Okay, so the latest post, uh, the most recent leak that's popped up from from Jason Ward is uh, Kylo's creepy castle. Okay, Uh, and again, this might actually end up playing directly directly into um the origins of the helmet and perhaps maybe even one of the MacGuffins that we've been you know looking to you know looking for this whole time all right so 
Uh, let me read. Uh, let me read you this portion from Kylo's creepy ca- uh, castle. So the sequence takes place at a creepy castle type of set. I've heard creepy castle and Sith temple, but I'm not to always. Um, but I'm not as always. But uh, yeah, this is written poorly. Okay, can't discern whether or not this is Sith or not. Sith temple being used synonymously with evil as it pertains to Star Wars. So somebody says Sith Temple, he doesn't know if it just means it's evil or if it means it actually does belong to the Sith. Uh, Jason was leaning towards it being a creepy castle because the only time I've heard of anything about a Sith and a monkey, and that was the guy forging the helmet, was when they filmed the one for Palpatine in The Empire Strikes Back's first iteration of his first appearance. Okay, so this is going back to Palpatine. For uh, in the, and the image that we saw of Palpatine in um, in the Empire Strikes Back before it was changed to Ian McDermott, where they used the monkey eyes. Okay, be that as it may, I am praying that the castle is Vader's castle. To me, that would be I'm fine with whatever they do, but that would be just uh, um, well, I don't I don't want to say a missed opportunity, but that would just be perfect, in my opinion, if they were reforging the helmet in Vader's castle. Okay. The Knights of Ren and Kylo Ren are all at the dark location together. The castle, or creepy domain, is owned by this ape man who agrees to help Kylo Ren fix his mask and to activate a device that will take him and his knights toward their goals. First, they must reforge the mask, and then they'll be ready to continue their quest. There was ash involved outside, which means it could be Mustafar. However, sources are mixed on this, and when Ray and Kylo flash fight later, and there's ash there too, it confuses if these are connected or not. Okay. Um, people I trust on the crew at Pinewood saw a trailer that Abrams cut that was pretty long and showed off their work. People who worked on the film said the Knights of Ren actually stalk around the work being done, excited and eager for the work to be done. I think there is more to the mask than we know because the Knights see this act as extremely important. The confusing part is that I've seen shots of Kylo fixing the mask himself. The Knights of Ren aiding in the repair and the ape with his hands we saw in the trailer. A part of me wonders if the ape fixes it and they do a ritual around it that makes it seem like they're fixing it if you don't see the entire sequence. Do they all work on the mask to bring their uh, their specializations to it? Or do they film it in different ways before making a choice about how it went down? And there's talk about all the Knights of Ren having special abilities. Okay, I heard the script was about 260 pages long last summer. And things shifted quite a bit on this film as the story was fleshed out. I would think this sequence could be explained away in a line about his mask being fixed. When we saw the mask being reforged in the trailer, I kind of started to worry as to whether or not it was one of those moments they toss us now to answer how the mask was fixed and then cut it when we see the movie and not question the mask too much. To be clear, this is just conjecture on my part. Okay. So, here's my big list of speculation, and then we'll dive into listener feedback for this uh, for this week. So, first, here's a big, big leap. Big, big leap on the speculation. But, what if the prophecy was never fully fulfilled? That's controversial, especially when you consider that we thought we had it fulfilled back in Return of the Jedi. Okay? Um, but, it would make some sense if we're looking to round out this whole trilogy or this whole nine part saga. If they're willing to go and not necessarily retcon, I don't like using that word. I like to use that word, but not lightly. But it would be interesting if they were to go and again, as a matter of perception, things that we thought had been complete were not complete yet. Okay. And what if it takes Ray and Kylo together to, to bring about the fulfillment of the prophecy, and the final bringing down of Palpatine. Okay, possibility. That's a big, big leap, though. We know that Rey is apparently on her own journey trying to find something that may or may, uh, that they both, her and Kylo, may or may not be be looking for. I can't help but wonder if Rey finds out at the beginning of the film, because I'm convinced in the in the trailer that what we saw there at the beginning with all of our main heroes standing there on the cliffside overlooking the water and the Death Star 2 sitting out there in the water. 
Um, we're assuming that Ray must go into it. Again, we're basing that off of the uh, off of the, the artwork that we've seen before. I can't help but wonder if perhaps Ray goes into the Death Star 2 to find out that Palpatine either can be resurrected or never really died. And that's what sends her on her journey at the same time that the Knights of Ren return from the beyond, either with Palpatine or with the ability to resurrect Palpatine. Okay. Um, I believe the First Order, I mentioned this earlier, is probably trying to establish itself throughout the galaxy through fear. That's where the big war to end all wars parts of it uh, comes in. And again, the rise of Skywalker could be that the galaxy is using the legacy of Skywalker and his inspiration to push back against the First Order once and for all. Kylo Ren is conflicted in large part due to his feelings with Rey. And I think that's going to play and weigh heavily at the end of this when Kylo Ren ultimately has to make his choice to bring about Ben Demption. I think Rey is definitely going to be the catalyst to that along with the father along with another threat and Kylo Ren realizing that, you know what, this was never what I thought it was going to be all along. Um, And again, Knights of Ren, perhaps coming back from the beyond with Palpatines or a way to bring him back. I am still convinced that in that leaked um, promotional poster that those red troopers are clone troopers. I still believe that's going to play into it. I think that Palpatine, either if he's not dead or if he left behind instructions, uh, created another clone army, and that's why they're red, and that's why they're called the Sith Army. That's just my speculation, though. Um, Teaming up. Mentioned this earlier. I I think it's still possible, but the problem I have with teaming up without seeing the film or knowing how it works out is there is a bit of a rehash taking place there if they do that again, especially about uh, with what happened in The Last Jedi. So... I'm not as keen on the speculation of them and the possibility of Rey and Kylo teaming up again. But again, we don't know. Um, the helmet transfers to somebody else. I think that's. I think the helmet's playing a key in this in some way, shape, or form. There's something unique and special about the helmet, and I think, again, that goes all the way back to J.J. Abrams' comments back in 2015. Um, Han, and with Luke's help, offering Kylo guidance to bring him back um, from the light. And I am still of the opinion that Kylo Ben ends up learning the truth about Anakin Skywalker at some point in this film. And that has a major, major impact on him psychologically in bringing about his his Ben Demption. I, I, I still believe that is that is going to be the case that Kylo Ren ends up finding out the full truth of what happened to his grandfather. And that that's going to be one of the driving factors that brings about Ben Demption. So what do you think? Email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, or drop me a comment on YouTube. That's a lot of stuff to digest and a lot of good stuff. All of it just has me so excited for this film, man. And what has me the most excited is that the creators are excited. That J.J. Abrams is excited. There was this fantastic interview that um, the Force.net did with Greg Grunberg, who is J.J.'s best friend and plays Snap Wexley, right, in the films. Uh, He talked about conversations that he had with J.J. Abrams and how he went in to watch the trailer with J.J. on his own and conversations he had with him about the script before the film was finished. And he mentioned how excited J.J. was about about what they had made with this movie. And you don't get that a lot with directors, man. You get, yeah, man, it's going to be good. You don't... You, you don't, in my opinion, I have I watch a lot of documentaries, and very rarely do you see a director who is being that upfront going, like, they are legitimately excited. And just because I feel like J.J. Abrams, J., I love J.J. Abrams' sensibilities in his films. I agree with almost all of the decisions that he makes in his movies. So the fact that that guy is excited over something as beloved as my Star Wars has me excited. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get into your uh, listener feedback for this week. I need someone to show me my place in all this. And again, the rules on listener feedback is if you post on YouTube and your name is already public, I'll mention your name. But if you email me directly, I'll keep it anonymous unless you tell me differently. Pandora Young writes this. Life is rad. Tap dancing, backflipping rad. What a great week. (laughs) 
Uh, and I'll be a reference on your resume any day. That is so cool. Thank you, Pandora. I appreciate that. You've uh, long been a bastion of, posi- of uh, positivity in this fandom. And now your, positive- your positivity with a full keg of coaxium in your tank. I also wanted to float the possibility on the trailer that I've not heard mentioned. Namely, that the opening scene of Ray and the TIE Fighter could be a force Skype, Skype scene. I agree with you. I think that's a possibility, too. I could imagine watching them tangle only for Kylo to find himself tilting at nothing into the void of space and Ray left alone again in the desert. We saw in The Last Jedi, although Snoke initiated their bond, it seems to have survived him and all and, and be happening all on its own. I could imagine for both of them the subsequent a year of, of sudden and involuntary intimacy would only serve to crank their mutual romantic frustrations. Well, yeah. Unable to accept or reject the other brought face to face may uh, they may be fighting or training or maybe it's both. Thank you, Pandora. I appreciate that. Severin writes this. Just wanted to say that your enthusiasm is contagious. Thank you. Uh, for the first time in my life today, I actually went on social media and defended my love for the new trilogy against one of my friends griping about the teaser trailer. It makes me sad that people get so stuck on the negative and the flaws of the new movies when they could be reveling in all that is good about them. It is so much more fun to be a fan than a hater. They need to, as Ray says, just let it in. Yeah, man. I love Star Wars so much. I really, really do. (laughs) All right. Uh, Jake Rivers writes this. And again, I may be doing some self-editing on some of these uh, comments because a lot of them are long, but I appreciate everybody that writes in. Uh, I think Rise of the Skywalker will be the legend of Luke Skywalker coming back to inspire the galaxy to rise up against the First Order. Yep, I tend to agree. Luke is a legend to some in the galaxy, but to some, he is the son of Darth Vader. And we know what happened to Leia when she was discovered as being the daughter of Vader. It didn't go well for her. However, the galaxy has been reset, and now we have the First Order reigning with an iron grip after destroying planets and forcefully taking control. At the end of The Last Jedi, we saw Luke Skywalker become a legend again. He stood strong and took on the First Order with just a laser sword. However, what happened on Crate was not seen by the galaxy. Uh, there has to be a lot of time passed, but even still, those would just become fork low, uh, fork, uh, folklore of heroism by Luke. The only way that could happen is some, someone or something recorded the events on Crate. Um, yeah, and he goes on to say a lot more, and thank you for the comment, Jake. But I also think, too, we saw that already at the end of The Last Jedi, where for whatever reason, the story had already started to spread because of the children that were sitting there playing with their makeshift toys there on, um, on Canto Bite. Uh, but yeah, I tend to agree. I think the rise of Skywalker has multiple meanings. Um, I know that when I named, when I titled my second book, Treasure in Darkness, um, I did that specifically uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, Treasure in Darkness for my Embark follow-up book, Embark Treasure in Darkness. It is, I'll I'll tell you just right up front, I I titled it that because there are multiple things in my story that I wrote that 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 comment of Treasure in Darkness can relate to. All right, Jinjin writes this, I burst out laughing when you said, shut up and take my money. (laughs) I feel the same way. It's overwhelming in a fantastic way. Uh, I'm a Kiwi living in Australia and feel like this trailer has united fans globally in a frenzy of excitement and wonder. P.S. Kylo was coming in a hot in, in hot to pick up his lady. Ben Demption and Raylo coming our way. They are going to unite to fight the greater uh, the greater evil. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, look. The trailer uh, has already broken the records from previous Star Wars trailers. And so I think that tells you all you need to know right now about the fandom of of Star Wars. All right. Uh, Aaron writes this. Uh, let's see. I just recently started listening to your podcast and I'm very much appreciative of the thought you put into everything. I also really appreciate your positivity, uh, your positivity since the force awakens. Uh, the fandom has been nothing but uh, negativity and it's a good to finally find someone who isn't so pessimistic about the Disney star Wars films. I think that somehow Palpatine created Snoke in order to manipulate Ben and the Skywalker bloodline once again. Now that Snoke is dead, I believe that Palpatine is back in some other kind of form. Not really sure what, though. I also think that the desert scene in the beginning is a training scene, especially since the scene of Rey running and the clip of her jumping are from different areas. If you look at the background, the mountains are different, indicating that she had some multiple attempts at that jump. This is kind of... 
Uh, this is kind of long, so I only have one other theory. I think the scene in the trailer from of Kylo in the forest is him taking down one of the other Knights of Ren, and the stormtroopers in the back are also revolted and firing on, on other knights. Yeah, I tend to again. I you know I talked about this. Um, I talked about this before, but I do think all of those things are a, poss- are a possibility uh, at this point in time. And thank you so much for the kind words, uh, Aaron. I really do. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, let's see. A friend of the show, Dylan, writes this. In regards to your discussion about the possibility of Rey being a virgin birth and actually the chosen one, I couldn't help but picture a scene in The Rise of Skywalker where a force goes to Anakin, explains to Rey that he was never meant to be the chosen one, but that it was her the whole time, confirming what Yoda said about the possibility of the prophecy being misread. How could that be? The idea of Anakin and Rey sharing scenes is absolutely thrilling, in my opinion. Yeah, I think there's a possibility of all that, uh, of that as of that as well. I think there's something big that could still happen with Shami Skywalker. Um, such a pivotal character, uh, played such an important role, obviously, giving birth, uh, midichlorian birth to Anakin Skywalker, and yet we know nothing about her background. All right, Baffled and Deranged writes this. Uh, hello, John. My thought is in the beginning of the teaser that Luke is talking to both Kylo and Rey about a thousand uh, generations being inside. Both Kylo and Rey hear Luke speaking at exactly the same moment, a force bond, while while Rey waits for Kylo to pick her up and continue practicing training sessions until they're ready to go for the kill. Palpatine is back somehow. (laughs) Thank you very much for the comments. All right. uh, This next one uh, comes from... uh, uh, Amparo, uh, since I also live in Minnesota, I know for sure you're very happy the snow is gone and we have a title and teaser for episode nine. Life is wonderful. Uh, besides the religious meaning we can attach to the rise of somebody or something resurrection, it can also mean a response to or a call or rise to the occasion. After all, JJ said there is a greater threat that they are, uh, but are they prepared for it? Um, bringing back Palpatine in some shape or form is really a big deal. I don't think they will treat this character in the same way Snoke was dispatched. Palpatine was an important piece of the puzzle. Another movie with basically the same title came into my head, The Dark Knight Rises. We all know The Dark Knight is Batman, all broken up and in exile, but he had to rise to the occasion because of a greater threat. You could say that Ben Solo is in some sort of self-imposed exile, and I see some similarities between the two characters. What do you think? Is it possible we are going to see an episode nine storyline similar to this move? No, I, I, no, I absolutely think that that's um, that's possible, and I do think that one of the reasons why they um, they announced Palpatine early on was to get the fandom ready for his return, because to have that be something that was exposed to on screen for the first time with the final movie could have ended up being very jarring. All right, uh, got another email here. Uh, let's see. We'll say this is Amanda. Uh, after finally being fed start with Star Wars news, I have to say that I'm overwhelmed with it all. I understand the secrecy and the wait, but I feel like my anxiety is somehow worse now. The fandom is crazy, much like it always is. But the question I see going around now is about how uh, definitive or ambiguous the ending of the saga will be. Not just with the fate of Ben Solo and Raylo, but the movie as a whole. Do you think that the backlash to The Last Jedi made them worried? Worry about what to do with nine, uh, that they will also make it vague. Love the show as always. Can't wait to hear from you next. Um, no, I, I look, I, I don't think that uh, any of the backlash towards The Last Jedi goes into any of the thought process of the creators of The Rise of Skywalker, Chris Terrio, and J.J. Abrams. Um, speaking just from, you know, from my own experience, um, creating content, whether it's for my radio show or whether it's the stories that I write, um, you write what you want to write. You write the story that thrills you the most, that you find most interesting. Um, to try to respond to things that other people might be upset, it's an it's a it's a wasted effort and effort in futility. Uh, so I don't believe that's the case. That there was any sort of thought about, well, we need to fix that or that, or we need to make sure we do this, we don't make the fans mad. No, mad. No, I firmly believe that they just go and decide to choose the stories that they want to choose. Uh, based off of what they think is best served for the story. 
All right, Blanca writes this. For me, Kylo Ren and Rey are two protagonists of the sequel trilogy. If they become brother and sister or cousins, they need um, they need to example in The Rise of Skywalker how and when, because I don't think Leia and Han had Rey and just left her on Jakku uh, with, um, with the threat of Palpatine. I just like Rey as a nobody or a Kenobi. But I like it if she was an adopted Skywalker. Her solo has her last name. That would be cool because she always uh, wanted uh, belonging. Yeah, and again, I, I tend to I tend to agree that she's going to end up being a um, being a uh, being a nobody. All right, I've um, got an email here. I'm going to keep it anonymous because they asked me to keep it anonymous. Uh, never written before, but I've listened to many of your podcasts. I've been a Star Wars fan my whole life. Um, I love listening to Star Wars podcasts, and yours has been especially fun to listen to. Your positivity for Star Wars is contagious and has been helpful during the dark times of the fandom trolls. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. I am a Raylo and a fan of Redemption. I agree uh, with Daisy in her recent interview the ration, that the relationship between Ben and Ray can be seen as toxic and the way that he uh, is right now is problematic. However, I also think this is why in TFA and The Last Jedi, the Force literally keeps breaking them apart. The Force doesn't want a toxic relationship between the two. It wants them to grow and, shall I say, redeem Kylo Ren back to Ben Solo Skywalker. I think that is why Daisy mentioned redemption at the end of her interview. Because uh, where their relationship left off was in a bad place. Yeah, I tend to I tend to agree, and that's a really good theory that the force itself is actually being um, one of the ones that's pulling them uh, pulling them apart. Um, they went on to write a whole bunch more, and I've read all of it. It's a fantastic email. Thank you so much for the email. I really do appreciate it, uh, and your your kind words. Uh, and thank you again to everybody. Uh, let's see. Let's go to. Um, sorry, I'm clicking through here. Alex writes this, uh, completely agree on what you have to say about The Last Jedi and a fan base. Uh, I found that there is a community of channels that basically just hate all the new nerdy, geeky stuff like Star Wars, Marvel, DC, and more. They are all just basically the same people hating on all of it. Well, I think there are many haters out there. Uh, they are just loud and toxic. It's sad, but I'm positive the fans outnumber the haters by the way no shade towards the people who didn't like the last jedi it's totally fine to dislike a movie i have a few friends that weren't fans of it it's just the haters i can't stand yeah exactly i'm right there um i'm right there with you on on that uh let's see sophia writes this kylo ren is skywalker reborn the clues are all over the place it's obvious once you start to see them thank you sophia uh let's go to maria I'm worried they will leave this Raylo thing ambiguous. It will ruin the whole movie for me if that's the case. I want to know for sure what happens. This is the end. I want answers. After this movie, I don't want to debate with anyone whether Raylo is remote, romantically canon or not. So they better make it clear as day for everyone to understand. That's just my opinion. I'm tired of the antis making fun of us, so I'm hoping it's canon. But anyways... I'm 95% sure that Ray and Ben Solo is Endgame. Pretty sure they're the reverse. Uh, reincarnated Anakin and Padme to bring peace uh, and balance to the galaxy. Narratively, only this makes sense to me. Thank you very much, Maria. I, uh, I very much appreciate your comment. Uh, let's see. Amanda writes this. I agree that Lucasfilm review, uh, revealing Palpatine so soon probably means that there are bigger things in this movie. But I'm also under the impression that Palpatine uh, was revealed in order to get those who said they were going to boycott Nine interested in seeing what happens with Palpatine in the movie and and end up uh, not boycotting. My mom is a very casual fan. She's not really a fan of Star Wars, but did see The Last Jedi. She's also under the impression that Kylo Ren and Rey could be related or even twins uh, in order to mirror the original trilogy. Once I told her about their ages, the twin thing left the table, but she still thinks they might be related. I'm so opposed to that idea, not just because I'm a Raylo. I wouldn't want to wait until the last movie to reveal them being related after Ray interacts with Han, Leia, and Luke, and nobody, uh, and no one mentioning it. Yeah, I tend to, uh, I tend to agree uh, from uh, about uh, about that as well. I, I don't think there's that they're going to end up being uh, being related either. And thank you so much for the comment. 
Coldeman writes this, the shot presumably of Kylo Ren's gloves pushing the flight controls might be taken from a completely different scene than the tie interceptor versus Ray moment. When it comes to trailers, especially te- teasers, never trust the edit. They're meant to set the tone, not the narrative. Uh, yeah, uh, I, however, I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree on that just because I'm going to say conventional wisdom says that that's Kylo Ren flying it um, in that moment, you know, but again, I'm open. That's possible, right? I know that they said that the, that the, the cast said in the uh, in the interview with Good Morning America that there wasn't anything deceiving in the trailer, so I'll take it for what it's worth. All right, um, Enfys Nest writes this. Well, those fan stories may have been interesting for you, but not the rest of us. Art is subjected, and the best art is the one that makes you question your opinions and virtues, not the one that panders to your specific tastes. Think out the box. Think out of the box. I'm 50 and enjoyed The Last Jedi, and it has even improved uh, The Force Awakens for me now looking back. Thank you for the comment. I appreciate that. Uh, Let's see. Mike says this. My fiancé and I were fortunate enough to be at the Episode 9 panel on all five days of celebration. How's bragging camp going? (laughs) I'm just, I'm kidding. That was a joke. I'm really happy for you, Mike. I'm jealous, but I'm happy for you. Uh, as Kennedy and Abrams came on stage, standing ovations and loud cheers came from the thousands of us in attendance. No one was showing any sign of anger or hate towards, uh, towards, towards them either. As the various cast members were introduced, nothing compared to the thunderous applause and energy for Kelly Marie Tran. Everyone was on their feet, clapping and cheering. She was speechless and brought to tears. It was truly an, an, an inspirational moment for the Star Wars fandom. I, for one, was proud to see everyone around me coming together. Uh, as always, thanks for your contributions and positive attitude. The increased backlash you spoke about is but a sign that you're doing something right. Um, P.S. When will I start referring to the movie as The Rise of Skywalker and not Episode Nine? I bet you have by now. All right, uh, let's see. E. Cruz Symphony writes this. I still believe that Rey is training, was training with Kylo instead of being a confrontation. Disney nor the cast would not give away that big of a, a secret, nor confirm that they were training together. That would be a huge leak. So it's best left seeing, uh, seeing it seeming as a confrontation, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's possible. Uh, Miss Suki Triple Seven writes this. Um, I love the trailer. Gave me goosebumps. I'm really excited about seeing the rise of Skywalker. Plus, Kathleen Kennedy's comment about hope gives me hope that we may get a redeemed Ben or a satisfying end, preferably with him um, and Ray together. Great show as always. Thank you, Misuki. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Got just a few more here. Uh, Andrea writes this. Uh, amazing show as always, John. I love your positivity. I'm a fan of Raylo and would love for that relationship to be explored with a redeemed Ben Solo, of course. Your podcast helped me helped me get my expectations in check, though, and just be excited about whatever it is we get with the rise of Skywalker. I can't wait to see all those characters together again, and I hope you're feeling better soon. I am feeling better. Thank you so much for the uh, for the comments. All right, just got a few more here. Um, and Thea Gaia writes this. I was at Celebration, and I can tell you that I experienced nothing but positivity when I was there. Everyone was super excited for Nine and The Mandalorian and basically any new content that we're getting. I ran into one person that told me he was more excited for The Mandalorian than Episode Nine, and we agreed to disagree on that. There was no putting down of anyone's excitement for anything, and I absolutely loved that about being there. I heard zero negativity about Ryan Johnson ruining Star Wars, or about Kathleen Kennedy, or about Raylo. I think people hide behind online personas, but in reality, most true fans really are excited about anything Star Wars, and my Star Wars fan, and any Star Wars fan, can find something to be excited about with the new content that we are getting. I love Celebration with so much more excitement than before, if that's even possible. All right, and uh, one more, another comment here from Amparo. Um, says, uh, hello, John. I know because of your line of work, dealing with negative comments is part of the game for you. However, I find it a bit unnerving to see how people can go on the offensive like that over a topic related to a fictional story. I miss the old days of the original Star Wars movies when we were just there to enjoy the ride and left the movie analysis to the film critics. And following this line of thinking, I have a question for you. 
I remember the way that I felt when I saw Return of the Jedi for the first time. Back then, for us, that was the last movie we were going to see, the end of the story. Back then, we accepted that this was the end of the Skywalker saga because the story was complete. Now, it seems, all the Skywalkers need to be dead in order for the Skywalker saga to end. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear, but it seems people are under the impression that the end of the saga means the death of the Skywalker bloodline and not the final end of the story. Is this the end of the Skywalker? Is this the end of the saga or the end of the story or the death of the main characters? Uh, good bless Amparo. Um, look, I am of the opinion that um, it's the end of the Skywalker saga, and that doesn't mean that uh, everybody needs to die in order for that to happen. I think it just means it just means victory, victory fulfilled, and we can end the rise of Skywalker in a similar way that we ended return of the Jedi, right? Luke Skywalker was still there. And you're right. We didn't, even when we started getting the prequel trilogy, we never knew we'd get seven, eight, nine. And we were fine with that. And one point on the negative fandom, and then we'll wrap things up. I do want to uh, do a quick promotion of my um, science fiction novel. So I hope you'll stick around for that. Um, but I just want to make one more quick point. Um, I'm going to go back to something that I used to do when I started the show, and I'm going to start doing it again. And I'm just going to start ignoring the outright um, negative comments that I get. That's not to say I can't take criticism. I'm more than happy to accept criticism. And people that want to email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, or leave a comment on YouTube. If you you know, you know want to critique and what offer your opinion, that's fine. But if you're going to if you're gonna hate uh, or you're going to be irrational about it, I'm just going to ignore it. Um, you do that, and if you're able to turn off Twitter and stay away from it, it can be like it was pre-internet when it was just positivity between between fans. And I just don't have enough time in my life to to deal with individuals who are going to be irrational over my love of of a particular Star Wars Star Wars film. And I'll say it again: if you don't like any Star Wars movie that I like. And if you don't like The Last Jedi, if you think it's the worst Star Wars movie ever and Ryan Johnson screwed up Luke Skywalker, that's f totally fine. You are, you are we are all completely entitled to our opinion. And I will respect your opinion in that. But respect mine for loving The Last Jedi and for, 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 for my opinion that I believe it's an absolute masterpiece. And I have to try to keep myself from, from watching it every weekend because I love that movie uh, so much. So... Uh, I'm glad Avengers Endgame is done because I'm ready for the rise of Skywalker and um, seeing the culmination of what they did with the with the MCU and that film has me so excited for the possibility of what J.J. Abrams uh, has directed and what he and Chris Terrio have written and I can't wait to just get my hands on every single piece of information and 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 merchandise leak and toy that comes out and every little detail and new. TV spot and trailer. I'm just ready to just enjoy the ride between now and the end of the year, man. Uh, you know, for for those of us that have been here from the beginning, this is so much fun. And Star Wars provides so much joy uh, to me uh, on, a, on a daily basis. It's it's a part of my family and a part of what keeps all of us connected together. And um, that's why I love it so much. And that's why 169 episodes in, I'm still just as excited every week to come and talk Star Wars with you. And I hope that you enjoyed this week's uh, this week's show. As always, subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel. Uh, you can find the show on YouTube, Podbean, Stitcher, Spreaker, the iHeartRadio app. Drop me a comment. Um, if you're on iTunes, leave a review as well. And if you want to support the show in any way, shape, or form, for those of you that might be new or if you've been listening for a long time and you haven't done it yet, um, the one way that I ask that you support the show is to uh, support my, uh, my efforts in storytelling. A couple of years back, I came up with an idea, and I wanted to know what it was like to create my own, my own story and my own set of characters the way that George Lucas did in hopes that um, – you know, people will read those stories and will will attach themselves to these characters in the way that I attach myself to the world that George Lucas created. And it's been an absolute thrill writing these stories. I can't wait to get the second book out. But if you haven't picked up the first book, uh, which lays all the groundwork for the trilogy, 
Uh, I hope that you'll go to Amazon.com as soon as you're done with the podcast. Look for John J O N Justice. Uh, the ebook is only two ninety nine. The paperback is eleven ninety nine right now, and the audiobook kind of varies in prices depending on if you purchase one or the other, or if you do a an Audible trial, you can actually get it for free, uh, I believe. And if you purchase the ebook for two ninety nine, you can pick up the um, audiobook narrated and produced by me for seven fifty. Uh, so, for those that aren't familiar with what the story is, I put together a little ad. I'll come back right afterwards. It's a minute long. I hope you'll stick around for it and familiarize uh, yourself or get familiar with the story that I've written. And then I hope you'll maybe go to Amazon.com while you're hearing this and grab yourself a copy of, uh, of Embark. For Earth, the end is near. Only a reluctant hero and the girl he loves have the power to save humanity's future. It's the not-so-distant future and car culture is replaced by air and space flight, made possible by two of Earth's largest corporations. Flight mechanic Taft Guardia spends his free time racing through the skies with his three best friends and the girl he longs to be with, headstrong Kate Amaro. With the planet on the brink of an industrial apocalypse, a powerful and ruthless corporate madman, Sint Argum, moves to exploit the disaster with his covertly created military. When Taft, Katha, and their friends uncover a shocking secret, Sin Argum will stop at nothing to find them. Time on Earth is running out, but with the help of a ragtag group of young pilots, they'll fight for humanity's future and survival among the stars. My nerd world. With the original story of Embark, I... I uh intentionally went into the story and put a lot of my own personality into it. And it was very much inspired, not just by Star Wars, but also Ready Player One and pop culture references. So I really hope you'll take a moment and go check the book out again. Amazon.com, John J-O-N Justice Embark. The follow-up book should be out, will be out in June. It's called Embark, Treasure in Darkness. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. And I'll be back again uh, next week for episode number 170 of My Nerd World, a Star Wars podcast. The Force will be with you always. My Nerd World. <laughs>